الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته right, bear me one second just get all this up and running السلام عليكم الشيخ yeah can you, can you yeah right, I think we're all good so, welcome back to the Verbal Outpost. I'm your host for today, Hamza, and as always, I've got my usual wingman in the studio, Shafiq, and we have a guest with us today, none other than Javid Khaliq, um, former IBO World Welterweight Champion, uh, defended the title seven times, that's awesome, seven times, and retired unbeaten as champion. That's pretty impressive. None other than Jabd Khaliq. Assalamu alaikum. How you doing, Jabd Khaliq? Wa alaikum How you doing? All good. All good. Right. I'll just stick all of them on, I think. There we go. Right. Right. How's it going? Hey? It's been good. Nice. It's not too bad. I'm just loving the weather, enjoying that for once. It's nice, isn't it? I need someone to look at it. <laughs> Yeah, the mics. Uh, bear with me one second. We'll get there. There we are. Yeah. Right, Shafiq, is yeah. this your... Is, is that all right now? Perfect. We're all, we're okay all now. Yeah, no, we're all good. We're all good. We're in a good place now. Um, right, yeah. So, it'd be good, right? Jeff, it's interesting having you here, man. So, I thought what we'd do, right? Um, we'll just get into like a quick fire round to begin with. Yeah. Just uh, break the ice a little bit, get to know you a little bit better. So, throw some questions out to you, okay? So... Either this or the other, and then you just very quickly you tell me which one you prefer, right? Okay. So early morning or late night? Late night. Late night. Oh. Okay. That's quite surprising, isn't it? That's you, think, you think someone who's who's I an I'm, athlete? I'm, I'm, I used to work late nights. Is it? So, okay. um, I think I wake up a little bit more later in the evening. I, I don't sleep very well. Um, I'm up all quite late, and then in the morning I feel a bit rough. Um, so some people call me a little bit moody in the morning. Ah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not bad at it. Like today, um, lovely weather. I was up, went for my little run, mm. and uh, and felt really good. So you'll have different days, you know, like, like a lot of people. Putting us to shame now. Went for a little <laughs> run <laughs> Sunday morning. Wow. Um, all right. Ketchup or mayonnaise? Oh, ketchup. ketchup. I can't stand mayonnaise. It's terrible. It's unhealthy. My kids love it. They put it on everything and try to get me to have some. Um, but no, I just, I've never, I've never really liked mayonnaise. Any particular type of ketchup? So we're talking about Heinz. Does it have to be Heinz or are you right with supermarket brand? Um, I don't mind supermarket brands, but I think Heinz is the main one. Is it? Oh, I've brought up on yeah. Heinz and, right. and, I, and you can kind of tell the difference. Okay. And, and, yeah, but and, the yeah. ketchup's not <laughs> yeah, But I have, I have um, tried other brands and yeah, yeah I'll pull, pull it with it. It's not too bad. Coffee or tea? I was never much of a coffee person, but I'm having more coffee lately, I've noticed. Maybe that's why I don't sleep very well. <laughs> um, it sort of relaxes me, and I think, uh, yeah, I've started to I mix it up a little bit. Sometimes tea, sometimes coffee. With breakfast, I love tea. In the evening, when I'm relaxing, I like a coffee. Mm -hmm. But not a strong, like a strong one. I, I like a milky one. Pure, okay. milk, pure milk, no water. Pure milk. Yeah, that's how my dad... Um, used to have it and that's how I love it. Okay, all right. Well, here's another question, right? It's not, I don't, I've not written it down. Semi-skimmed or full fat? Again, I used to have semi, uh, full fat. And then yeah. all this stuff about milk's not good for you and the rest of it, it kind of scared me a little bit. And then I went on to semi-skim for a while. And now I'm, I'm really? up and down. My kids love full fat. Yeah. So sometimes yeah. I have full fat. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes semi-skimmed. Um, but I think I've gone back to a bit more full fat than semi-skimmed. I felt, I felt, I think I felt my joints and stuff were not were suffering a little bit. Maybe it was that. Maybe it was some, in my head. I'm not sure. It tastes a bit nicer as well, isn't it? Because we've been through the exact same thing. It was in Ramadan, last Ramadan. We only had full fat. I yeah. had it with some cereal, and I was like, wow. <laughs> I don't know how people that's do semi skim. To be creamier. honest, it's a yeah. lot more creamier. And yeah, when you when you're used to it, and you have semi skim, it's like it's like water. <laughs> and then once I tried um, the red top. And that was terrible. That was like water. I've, 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 I've never, I've I've never gone that far. I couldn't even drink that. I don't mm. think other people have that. It's crazy. Yeah. I've, I've never gone that far. Have you ever tried like almond milk or anything like that? But yes, my brother's very big on almond milk and soya and mm. other stuff. And, and I've tried it. 
who leaves the after oh, okay. and I don't mind almonds I love almonds I love them things but with milk um, it just doesn't sit well with me mm -hmm. and um, you know I've, I've had milk all my life I've like ugh, I used to have a whole the old bottles back in the day and I used to have one we used to have one of them back in the morning one in the evening one in the day sometimes yeah. and never really ate much meals it was always milk and then all this stuff about milk so good you know I, I, I don't know it's uh, it's it's very confusing. It keeps on changing, isn't it? Every, yeah, everything every changing. Years it keeps on changing. Mm. Right. Uh, Makkah or Medina? Makkah or Medina. Um, I've, I've not actually been, so um, okay. I'd love to go. Um, so I can't really say. Okay. Okay. My uh, nephew's just recently been, my dad has been, uh, and, and uh, they were telling me. They didn't really, they didn't really choose one, but they said it was a, a, a beautiful experience, and yeah. uh, they've got me thinking about going definitely. Inshallah soon. Inshallah. So, inshallah. Um, ho hopefully for all of us. Mm. Um, speed or accuracy? That's a tough one because you need accuracy. And with accuracy, sometimes you, you build speed and, and vice versa. So um, I think accuracy. Accuracy. Okay. All right. Uh, Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson? <laughs> uh, it's got to be Muhammad Ali. Okay. Uh, Mike Tyson is a very close... Second, right, he's, close. he's a very close second. I yeah. loved him. I, I was brought up um, watching him. He was a different kind of fighter to Muhammad Ali, but Muhammad Ali was a different person, mm -hmm. not just a fighter. He was um, somebody special. He revol he revolutionised what boxing was, isn't yeah, it? Because yeah. back then it was he, he, he stood up, he stood up for things and and he, and he was there for the people. He was, mm -hmm. he was different. It wasn't just boxing, yeah. um, and, and and the sacrifices he made, um, you know, made him someone special, and that's why people love him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Amir Khan or Prince Nassim? Nassim. <laughs> oh, it's got to be Nassim. Again, I was brought up with Nassim. Um, he was the one that actually inspired me to take that step to, to turn professional. Mm -hmm. I was never serious about boxing before that. It was something I loved, a, a hobby. Um, but seeing him doing well at an Asian, not many Asians at the time, mm -hmm. um, gave me that little bit of a push that, and, and that inspiration I needed. Uh, and the support I needed from my family, so definitely um, him. Last one, I promise. Last one. And we're just going to go to a break in a couple of minutes as well. Uh, Nigel Ben or Chris Eubank? This is, going, this is going quite far back now. Yeah, yeah. You know what? They were in my era um, just before I started, you know, mm. boxed. Um, Chris Eubank was uh, a funny guy, somebody um, who had done some weird stuff, but. It actually made sense. It, it's weird, but it's I, don't know, I think you have to have a boxy brain or a bit of a mud kind of way of thinking. And he, he kind of, yeah, um, he kind of grew on me, okay. just like his son. He grew on me until recently <laughs> when he <laughs> lost. Um, but yeah, I think uh, Chris Eubank. I think Chris Eubank. Nigel That's Ben right. was good in his own right, um, but he was more of a a rough aggressive fighter not my style not my kind of way okay, of fighting right. um, but very exciting very good to watch yeah yeah yeah. Chris he, he was eccentric isn't he he's yeah. still like that now isn't he, he? He's, and, he's, and, and, and you wouldn't imagine him being a boxer and it was just so weird you kind of see these like two completely different things yeah, yeah he was yeah. Like, you know, smashing it in boxing I think, I think he got general public to watch him because of the way he was not yeah. just boxing fans everybody wanted to see what is this guy on about you know is he crazy is he mad is he what Mm -hmm. uh, and then the things he used to say about boxing, he hates boxing and the rest of it, uh, and some of the comments he used to make, uh, made people want to see more of him, and mm -hmm. some wanted to see him lose, some, more, some just loved the excitement of him. So, you know, going back to that time, right, because you got into boxing around the 90s, isn't it, right? Yes. Sort of late 80s. Late, 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 late 80s, when I started, but as a professional, it was late 90s. You turned pro around, was it 97, I think? Yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, and, and 97, yeah, when I was okay. 27. What was it like back then, man? Because we're, we're seeing some Pakistani boxers from, or, or, or from the subcontinent now, right? Mm. But back then, there was nothing. Oh, it's, um, it's amazing. I've seen so many everywhere I look. There's like Asian boxers doing really well, making a name for themselves, and some really good ones. But then, before the 90s, when I started, um, there was no Asians. There was no Asians. There was not very few black people. Or colored people in any kind of um, you know er, er, uh, venue that I used to go to. I used to go to all these working men's clubs, villages, and places to, and, and there was just white faces everywhere. They'd look at you, and the whole the whole room would go quiet. 
Mm. And you know why they've gone quiet. You know, they're looking at you and then, and then you'd, you'd hear them little jeers and the noises and, and the words that are coming out with, you know, and you try to block it out. Yeah, you, you know, you get, you get some racist stuff said, being said. Do, do you know what? We're just going to go to a quick break, uh-huh. right? Oh, it's, it's the worst possible time. I was just about to yeah, I was just about to have a racism as well. <laughs> I know, I've got like 20 different questions. I just want to know more about it. But we've got to cut to an Azan break. So j- just we'll be back in about two, three minutes. So don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Verbal Outpost. We are in the studio today. We have none other than... We have a world champion, a former world champion in the studio with us today. We've got none other than Javed Khalik, former IBO world champion. Um... Defended it seven times, unbeaten, retired. Um, so, Javid was just telling us about, just before we went to the break, telling us about what it was like competing back in the day, late 80s, early 90s, what the scene was like back then. So, we had to go, but please do carry on because yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that was fascinating, man. It was such I a was different just, time. I was just getting excited uh, remembering some of the old, good old days. <laughs> Um, they were good days now, but at the time it was quite difficult. It was really hard. And like I'm saying, you go to venues, you, you see no brown faces, no black faces. You know, the odd place you might see one or two, and uh, the whole crowd will just go quiet. They turn around, look at you, and uh, and start, you know, whispering stuff. And, and you know, they're talking about you. Just have this feeling that they're talking about you. And uh, with me, it used to g me up even more and motivate me, make me think I've got to shut them up. I've got to shut them up. I've got to perform. And uh, I was always putting extra pressure on myself anyway. Um, didn't want to lose, didn't want to um, let my family down, let my friends down. Um, the few that used to come, I didn't used to tell many people that, that you know, that I'm boxing and stuff. Um, but most of the time, I think, um, 90% of the time, I went to these places and, uh, and won. So, you know, I'd always do quite well. And all of a sudden, everybody would be like, yeah, well boxed, well boxed. And they were really appreciative and, um, and, uh, and, and come you know, congratulate you and, and change from how it was uh, at the beginning. Did you find that it got easier as you st- as you started competing and winning more? Did it get easier yeah, over think, time? I think um, more people started getting involved, yes. You'd see more faces um, and being in the papers, on the news quite regularly. I think a lot of people got to know me around the areas, um, especially locally until I went a bit further out. And when I went a bit further out, I think there was a few more faces as well. And, uh, and it did get easier uh, in that, or, or it was just mentally easier because I, I knew what to expect. Um, so if it wasn't that bad, if it wasn't that bad, it's cool. If it's bad, it mm-hmm. just motivated me even more. Um, and, you know, I always rise to the challenge. That's impressive, man. That's impressive. What was it like with your family? Because I think back then, you, you're that generation slightly older than us, the yeah. Shafiq, and you guys had it a lot harder. You're the first, gen- sort of second generation, but the oldest of that second generation, mm-hmm. right? Still parents, they're still having to deal with quite toxic racism, right? Yeah. Grafting away, working in hards, most, most of them sort of factory workers, manual laborers, or corner shops, taxi drivers, well, whatever. And they always had that, that generation always had that ambition of yeah. doctor, lawyer, engineer, Accountant, and it was always you had to be that, and it could be nothing else. And what was it like growing up during that time, man? That's right. Um, my parents came from Pakistan. They had a tough life here, you know, and they wanted to make a better life for themselves. And that's all they t- always talk about, you know. You got to work hard. You got to make uh, something of yourself. You got to show your family. You got to um, do well for us. And they'd be pushing us always to study, to study, study. And um, I think because they didn't speak very well English, didn't speak very good English. It affected us. We didn't. We we wasn't. Um, we were bilingual, so we would work. We were trying to learn our language plus English, and it was hard because at home my mum didn't speak English. My dad was very mm. new to it, and he was he spoke a little, but not much. So we'd speak in Pakistani at home. Outside, we'd struggle with the English, and gradually um, we got better at it. But I think it took years before we really um, got our sentences right. In the English <laughs> sense, it was always a bit, you know, a few words of our own and a few English and so on. And I think that affected the studying, and a lot of older generation didn't realize these kind of things, and even the next generation, I think, Um, because we've had people marrying from Pakistan, and it still affects the kids. And then they expect the kids to be, you know, the best at uh, studying when they can't help them at home. They can't give them that Mm. help and that support they need at home. It's not about going to school and and it gets done, no. 
it's very difficult because the teachers have got so much to do nowadays, especially with the kids the way they are. Um, they don't make it easy for the for the teachers. So I think um, it was very difficult. And like like most of the Asian families, they wanted me to be a doctor. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a, a doctor or an accountant or a doctor. And most of the time, it was a doctor. And then I told my dad, I thought I've, I've kind of become a doctor. I, through the years of learning through the boxing and the injuries and everything, I've learned a lot of uh, <laughs> <laughs> manipulation and, and understanding of the human body and, and had injuries myself. And, and now I can explain to all the gym people what's wrong with them. And I told my dad, I said, look, see, yeah. I'm half a doctor there as well, as well as, well as a boxer. No, I was, I was just going to um, ask as well, because that's a really good point about the education side of things, where you have someone who doesn't understand English at home um, properly, so having that expectation on you and that pressure on you to become a doctor, as you say, will be a lot more difficult because it'll be a lot more difficult for them at school um, picking the language where m my kids, they all speak English um, at home, so it's easier for them to understand, but they're mixed in with other students who are from Poland, from Romania, and so like you can tell they're always struggling at school, whereas our kids are excelling a little bit more just because they know the language already, so it's easier for them to understand. So I thought that's a really uh, good point because there's always that disadvantage there for you, isn't there? I think I didn't really get my confidence until later on in my late 20s when I was doing interviews, when I was doing more interviews um, on radio, on TV, and I started um, watching what I was saying. And and be careful how I'm putting my sentences together. And then I started realizing, you know, how bad I was, and I've got a little bit better. I'm still not perfect. I, mean, I still make a lot of mistakes, um, but I think I'm a lot better than I used to be, and that's through a lot of ups and downs and a lot of problems that I probably had and faced and um, uh, a lot of them don't have that experience that I've got. I mean, I mean, life's a lifelong journey, isn't it? I mean, we're always learning whatever it is through kids or, you know, whether it's improving English or whatever it is. Mm. There's always that improvement going on. So that's, that's good. It's good to hear. Um, so you turned... So there's this, like, awful racism that you have... Initially, initially, because there's nobody on the scene. Your parents are okay with it. They did have ambitions for you to become a doctor and go down the standard route. You kind of broke the mold, did something a little bit different, um, which was even in Nottingham. I, I, I don't know if there's many other Pakistani boxers that are in, in the East Midlands. I'm not aware of any of them. It's not like I'm particularly connected to the scene, but even now it's still quite difficult. Um, then you turn pro around 27, right? Yeah, that's right. You turned professional 27. Yeah, yeah. What was that like? Because typically, I, my understanding is usually people turn, they'll be doing it from a very young age, they'll mm -hmm. turn pro around 18, 19, 20. Is that, yeah. from that sort I of think, age? I think, I think most sports, they expect you to um, take it more seriously or turn professional earlier, um, and especially boxing and stuff like that because it's a young one's game. You pick up mm -hmm. everything, you do it without thinking about it. I didn't start amateur till I was 17. And even then, I was just playing with it. It was just a few years, and I done really well. And then I went to Pakistan a couple of times. I went, got married again, you know, the second time I went. So I had two years off in between that time, and I was just working, doing a bit of taxi driving, working at my dad's shop. Um, and then around 23, 4, I came back into boxing a bit more serious, saw a person see him on the scene, and um, that sort of inspired me. And then I entered the ABAs. I won the ABAs at 26. Okay. And uh, that's the All England champ you know, Championship, which a lot of the top, Nigel Ben, Chris Eubank, all these top bros back in the day won that. Um, you have, you know, you fight in each town all around the um, UK and then go to Scotland and Wales and, and everything and, and fight them. And, and then it, that was on BBC, I think, at the time, the finals. Um, and I won that. And then I thought, you know, maybe I can do something. And then um, I'll, try, I'll try a few years as a, as a pro and see how it goes. And I went to the same gym as uh, Prince Nassim Ahmed. Um, he was in, on the verge of leaving it in Sheffield at Brendan Ingalls. Brendan Ingalls, isn't it? Yeah, he was there. Um, so I was there for three years, uh, my first three years of my contract. Mm -hmm. He left about a year and a half, two years after I got there. Mm -hmm. But a lot of time he was training separately to all of us. He'd come and go. You know, I trained with all the other big, big names, the Johnny Nelsons, the Ryan Rose, and uh, um, a few others, uh, Junior Witter and stuff. So... Um, it was a very good experience, and Brendan taught me a lot, you know, um, um, the words, that, the things that he said. I think, I think that was very, very important. Is there anything, we've, we've got to get to a break in about two, three minutes. Anything particular, anything in, interesting he said, anything that you remember, or anything that left a, 
imprint on you. Brendan. Yeah. yeah. Brendan, Brendan, yeah, he's, I think um, uh, all the boxers at his gym, um, he's, t- he's told them this and they all know this, you know, uh, boxing is one of, the, one of the legal sports that you can actually get killed in. And that resonates, it reminds you every day that you've got to train hard, otherwise you could get hurt, you know what I mean? Um, you know, so that makes you realise it's not just a sport, this is serious. Mm. So you can't be messing about or playing with boxing. Um, I, and there's been a few deaths as well, right? I mean, it's... The Exa- the exactly, deaths. there's been a few deaths, a few fatalities, uh, where people have got injured, and um, they've tried to make things a lot safer, but there's more, in statistics, there's more injuries in other sports like rugby and motor yeah. racing and stuff than boxing but boxing is more yeah. it's highlighted more because it's a contact sport yeah. and you're, ten, you're, you're, you're trying to hit somebody and hurt them so it looks bad compared to like MMA because MMA is it's not it's not safe but I, I'm not aware of any fatalities oh, and it's uh, dying yeah I'm, I, don't think there's, I think there's one recently not long ago I read about something I might be wrong um, but there's not been as many but it's a lot more brutal and you'll see a lot more cabbages and broken noses and uh, deformed uh, yeah, uh, features. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it's a little bit, it, it, there is a lot of technique to it as well. It's, I mean, I've already got into it and been watching it a lot and um, it, is, uh, it is very, very tough as well. Hmm. So you turn pro uh, 27, right? ABA. That's the amateur scene that you participated yeah, yeah. in. Um, is there pressure? Is there pressure to turn pro? or so, so Where does it come from? Or is it just when you're ready as a boxer? I, I think a lot of people don't understand this. They're always asking me, can we turn pro? Can we turn pro? Anybody can train professional. As long as you can get the license and you look competent enough to, to defend yourself. But that doesn't mean you're going to achieve anything. You want to get as much experience as an amateur so you can do better as a pro. Otherwise, you can, again, like we said, you can get hurt. So if you've not boxed at a decent level as an amateur and got the experience, you're going to really struggle because the pro game is a lot harder, the gloves are smaller, the rounds are longer, uh, and the people hit hard. So yeah, you you know um, you can uh, you can turn pro, but you need to, you need that experience. Do you ever get that? Because I mean, you're a coach now, right? Do you ever get people coming in and you know that they're not ready for it? So oh, all, all, all the time. Um, really? I was just talking to a few recently. Um, I get so many people coming to the gym telling me that they're self-taught boxers <laughs> and they've been watching YouTube and, and um, Instagram and TikTok and the rest of it and, 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 and I go, yeah, that's okay, come on, let's have a look at you. And they can't move properly, they can't punch properly, they can't defend themselves properly and I'm like, what is wrong with people nowadays? There is a lot of good stuff on Instagram and YouTube but a lot of it is for show, it's not what you can actually use and do in the ring and this is what people don't understand. If they try some of them moves and some of them things in a ring, they're going to get hurt. And I keep telling people this, and this is something I'm going to be um, putting out there on Instagram and, and, and TikTok very soon, <laughs> to let people know. If you want to learn proper boxing, go to a gym, go to somebody with experience. Now, I've got 38 years of, um, of, of boxing experience. I'm not saying I'm, I'm the best or, or um, you know, I don't make mistakes. We all do. But I've got a lot of experience. And... You need somebody that can pass that experience on to you and, uh, and help you in the right way. That is shocking that anybody thinks they can watch YouTube videos or even self-taught. Because I, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Mm-hmm. I watch videos, but that's only outside the gym. That's only outside of regular training. Yeah. So two to three times a week. If I didn't do that, I'd just watch YouTube. No chance. I, honestly, it made, it's made me laugh. I, I've, had, I've had numerous people come in and, say, and saying that, and I'm like, oh, this guy must be really good. And, and I'm shocked. Right. Uh, we need to go to a quick break. We're going to be back in about three, four minutes. Don't go anywhere. And uh, we'll be back shortly. Assalamu alaikum. We are back. On a very short break, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty short break. Uh, we're back on the verbal outpost. We've got um, none other than Jabd Khalik in the studio with us. Now we've got a full uninterrupted 25 minutes to talk, which is awesome. Um, just before the break, we're talking about self taught boxers that want to turn professional, that walk into your gym <laughs> and want to turn professional and seem to know everything. Mm. I think, I, th- I think there's a lot more than uh, than we think. You know, there's a lot more people that are actually doing this. Um, there's a lot of a lot of people copying stuff off the internet, 
and uh, I'm trying to copy what champions are doing. And I've told them so many, so many times, you know, you don't understand them champions have been doing that for 10 years before they got to that kind of level or being able to do them kind of moves. You need, to, you need to get the basics first. You need to get the basics, get your foundation, and then build on that. Then you have a good, good chance of getting somewhere. But you can't just jump from there, you know, right to the top. Just by watching a few a few videos, you know, you're going to make so many mistakes, and uh, and it shows when they come to the gym. Um, it's it's just it's just terrible, honestly. Yeah. Have you had any of these guys that have come in like that and stuck it out, and have become really good now, and uh, they're all trained about? Have they just left after a bit after oh, they realise how hard it is? Have they just left? Have you had some people that have stuck it out with you? Yes, I've had a, I've had a few that have been doing now for three or four years maybe, and they said, oh, we can't believe that you know we were doing what we were doing for such a long time. Mm-hmm. And then we've come here and we've actually had to go back to the start, back to scratch and start from the beginning and do it. And now, what we're doing now, we would have never been able to get do that back then. And you know, with boxing, right? Because with BJJ, when you start, the way you learn is by being submitted. Yeah. It's quite a deep thing, right? So you have to be submitted. For you to work your way through, mm-hmm. you have to be humbled. I you have to be kind of humiliated. I was just going to say, you have to be humbled. And sometimes you have to learn to lose to be able to come back mm-hmm. and understand what it feels like and see if you've got that mentality and that understanding and, 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 and the heart. Mm. And, and in boxing, right, in people that are advanced, I completely get that, okay? So people have sort of stuck it out. They've gone through the highs and the lows mm. and they've made it and they've been incredibly successful. But then what about, you know, right at the beginning point? How uh, are there a lot of egos in the gym? Is what I'm trying to get at. So oh, do, yeah, do you okay. tend to get a lot of egos? Because yeah, I find yeah, in BJJ yeah, yeah. people are quite. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I don't find it that common within BJJ. Yeah. But I don't know. Boxing's like. I, th- I think um, in boxing, I think there's a lot more egos. Mm. I think you get a lot of people come off the streets. They 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 well respected or they they do well on the streets. Boxing right. is not like the streets. It's totally different. You know, I'm not a street fighter. If I went on the streets, I'd probably get battered. Come in boxing, I'll be still be most of them. Mm-hmm. Sorry, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, they, you know, um, totally different kind of different concept. Yeah, and there's rules, there's regulations, there's technique. That technique is what makes the difference between a novice boxer and a more experienced boxer. Mm. And in terms of yeah, like taking it to the streets as well, because. This one thing that I always think is that, is that BJJ, yeah, there's a lot of rules and, you know, you can't punch or anything like that. There's no striking. Mm-hmm. But compared to the average person or the average street fighter, right, in those, like, quotes, um, it's going to work against 99% of people. Mm-hmm. And with boxing, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's a very similar thing as well. Yeah, is I, think, that, I, think it's similar, I think it helps you be more aware. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think we stress not to take it out on the streets. To kiss, it's all boxing, BJ, all of these are all about self-control, mm. not fighting outside. You know you're capable of doing damage, um, but you're, go, you're confident enough to stand there and hold your ground. And, show, and, that, and just showing that confidence can deter people. But more than that, it can cause more problems when you start fighting with people. So we tell everybody not to fight unless it's necessary to defend yourself. Um, we get a lot of kids that come just to build their confidence in our gym, and that's a big, big thing. It's not just confidence... Um, for the boxing, it's confidence in general life to help you with life skills. So we want people, to, young people, to come to our gym to help with their health, um, their well-being, and more than that, their confidence mm-hmm. um, and their general well-being, uh, their, their confidence outside, in school, at home, in, in, in uh, with friends and everything. You know, because a lot of our, I think a lot of our, our Pakistani people, especially the young people, they, they, um, because like we talked earlier about the. The, the, the two different bilinguals and the Asian lingo and, the, and the, um, English, I think it, it gets confusing for some of the kids. When they go out, they're not able to socialize as well. They, they lose that confidence because they're not able to socialize well. Our foods are very bad. We eat the wrong kind of foods. It's all very um, rich uh, and very unhealthy and oily and um, and too much. <laughs> Everywhere you go, if you look at it, it's like, a chokao, a chokao, a chokao. Chasha pizza, not chasha. It's a it's a it's a three course meal. Mm-hmm. Uh, wherever you go to family, and that's our social life. We 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 eat, we eat, we eat, and then we say, oh, I don't know how I got this big. Mm-hmm. 
I don't know why. I don't know why I'm on di- diabetes tablets. I don't know why I've got a heart problem. I don't know why I've got this health issue. And we all um, want to make things better after we get these problems. You know, why get to them problems? Um, just get active. Go for a walk. Get fit. You don't have to come to the gym and kill yourself and try to be a boxer. We've okay. got classes for older guys and, and females soon we're going to be having classes for. Just to get fit and active and, and get a healthy lifestyle and more um, help with your well-being as well, your mental uh, mental side of things. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's not just about fighting. Mm. And I was, I was going to ask, the, like, you know, Hamza's mentioned BJJ and there's obviously MMA and stuff. Has that affected your business uh, in any ways in terms of numbers? Because obviously back in the 90s, boxing was the big thing. Um, and as it sort of got towards the 2000s, MMA became, you know, massive and everyone started sh- showing an interest in that. Did that affect the amount of students coming in wanting to learn boxing? And was that a struggle with you trying to bring um, with classes and things like trying to market mm-hmm. boxing again? Because now everyone's focusing on MMA. Was that difficult for you during that time? No, I think um, that's a totally different audience. Mm-hmm. And I think it's helped. Um, it's a healthy competition in a sense. Mm-hmm. And uh, more so than that, We've got a lot of MMA people coming to the boxing gym because they start on their feet. They need boxing. Mm. And a lot of them are weak on their boxing. And they need a proper boxing coach to help them to stay on their feet and not get taken down and move around with their footwork Mm -hmm. and and be able to punch correctly. And if you look at most of the top guys now, they're some of the best boxers and they're going going into boxing because there's more money involved in boxing and and, and they're they're capable of fighting some of them boxers. So if anything, it's helped boxing um, because it's a healthy competition mm. more people are coming not just for boxing but from MMA that want to improve their boxing and I've had people um, and I've had people come try to take me down as well oh is it <laughs> and I've done quite well so <laughs> I've, I've thrown a few over the top yeah, man. <laughs> so I wish um, MMA had uh, started a few years before <laughs> I started I think I'd have been pretty good in it well, I was actually saying that then do you think you would have if MMA was around do you think you would have moved towards MMA rather than boxing um, I'm not really sure no, I, I don't see what MMA under, I don't think I'm that kind of a, 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 a rough fighter, but at the same time, I'm a very proud um, a, a, and strong fighter. And I think I was very good at wrestling. I had th- uh, three brothers. I was <laughs> to fight all the time at home. And, uh, and one of my brothers was quite str- uh, strong that way there. He's a little fatty in his <laughs> I could get him off there. So uh, it was hard to wrestle. And uh, we used to wrestle all the time, so I think that helped me. Yeah. So when I was wrestling, uh, a couple of the lads that came to for their boxing a few years ago, they were like 18 stone, but I still took them over, and I was like, so I was shocked. I think, plus watching it, I've picked up things. Yeah. I think I've picked up a lot of moves, and um, just by watching it, I've not done a lot of MMA, um, and recently, I, well, a few years ago, I opened a gym in Bahrain, and they had an MMA side, oh, oh, okay. they had an MMA side there, and um, I was there for about six months, and then the lockdown happened, and I had to come back. Right. Um, and they had an MMA side, and a guy from Brazil was there doing their coaching, and one day he said, come on, let's have a let's have a, a, a little, little wrestle and they were all watching us and uh, at first I'd done one of these students and I, and I beat him and I was like shocked you know, took, took anything out of me <laughs> then he'd come and he was like a little, t- like a little Tyson not a little a big Tyson mm-hmm. yeah? and we were at it for about five or six minutes and I got him in two or three moves I got him in a choke I got him in an arm bar almost almost <laughs> then get him and in the end I was just knackered and he got there <laughs> <laughs> what belt was he? Um, he was a, he was a, he was a black belt. He was a black he belt. He was a black belt. He was um he was a okay. jiu-jitsu coach as well. I don't know okay. what else. Okay. Um, he didn't speak brilliant English, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he was he was very strong, very good, and nearly had him. Nearly had him. I think the cardio helped me, but but, but because I was in, I wasn't training much in bar. You know, I was eating more. And all that, and <laughs> I was starting to put on a bit of a belly. I think I got started a little bit. Yeah. That cardio is really. So I've got to go back there and have a rematch because I never like losing. <laughs> You know what? My, so my B, my BJJ coach um, trained in Bahrain for quite a while. Oh, did so it's, quite, it's very big in Bahrain. Yes. Very big. Yeah. Boxing has started to get big, but there's a lot of MMA places there, and they're mm-hmm. already quite um, established there. Yeah. It's quite surprising. I was in uh, Qatar, um, in Doha, about yeah, six yeah. months ago, and it's just shocking how much stuff they have. You mm. know, like at, sort of athletic-wise, they've mm. got quite. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're putting a lot into sport now. Yeah. They're putting a lot into sport. The thing is, they don't have alcohol, and so it's not this like Friday, Saturday nights. Yeah. So what a lot of people do is they'll have, they'll socialise around sports. That's quite yeah, nice. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. boiling hot as well. So things, particularly inside a gym, so mm. outdoor outdoor sport is a little bit harder because about That's 40, right, 45 yeah. degrees. <laughs> most of the year is hot. It was very hot. But indoor, it's AC. Yeah. It's quite nice, yeah, and yeah. That, that's that's thrived in those Golf countries. So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's that's interesting, man. Good opportunity. Mm. So you're looking to go back out there. 
I'd love to, but I think I think I found it quite difficult without my family, mm. and uh, um, and I think it's a different lifestyle. I took my family over there for four weeks. They loved the place, but they didn't like the lifestyle. It's just, it's it's just you just go out, chill, go to the coffee shops, go to the eat, eat, eat play, eating places, and come back home. So you, and you don't even walk around a lot because, like I say, it's too hot. It's hot. You can't go out much. So it's just the the malls, home, coffee shops, home, restaurants, home, mm-hmm. and there's a few activities to do, but not massive and uh, then you miss your family your friends everything else so uh, it might be difficult to go back I might go just occasionally there and, and see them what time of the year did you go because uh, especially for us going from here I, I think it was February March February March yeah. okay okay so it's not well, that's not too yeah. it's not too hot there was a time when it was 50 degrees mm. it, was, it was really really hot yeah. you were there when it was 50 yeah. wow gosh yeah, yeah, yeah it was really hot they were telling me not to go outside because I was I was like, I want to go out, I want to go out and walk around. Go was, no, you will get ill, don't go out. <laughs> That's his accent, sorry. But, well, you know what, I, I remember, so first day we got there, the next morning, we thought, right, um, so we're told, listen, the nearest, uh, like, subway, the train station is just, it's, it's about a 10-minute walk. So mm. I thought, well, okay, how, how bad can it be? And everyone said, no, listen, you just get a taxi. You yeah, get a taxi yeah, yeah. everywhere. I was like, look, it's a 10-minute walk. I'll go with the kids and everything. It's, it, it can't be too difficult. Oof. <laughs> Three minutes in. Honestly, that's exactly what Three minutes in, it was like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect this. That's some serious heat. Serious heat. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it's not a surprise they're struggling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I ask, do you know with the sort of students you get now compared to how um, in the 90s, early 2000s, we've spoken a little bit about how students struggle a bit more with their attention span, you know, with social media, with them being on their phones all the time. Have you noticed that? In the gym as well, do you know when they come in and train? Like, have you noticed that it's a little bit more difficult with the, this generation mm-hmm. um, in terms of training them compared to the ones you had in the 90s, early 2000s? Yeah, definitely. I think obviously I wasn't coaching at that time, but I was training yeah. myself at that time um, in, the, in, the, in the early 90s and 2000s. Um, but now I think the, pe- the young, young people nowadays are totally different. Like you said, they've got no concentration, they've got very little coordination because there's not as, there's not, they're not as active as they used to be. Mm. They're very good with their fingers, yeah. playing games, and on the computer or the phones, but they can't coordinate their hands and feet, number one. Secondly, they're not as hardworking. They feel like they deserve everything and they get everything uh, easily. Um, it, it's like... Entitlement, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like... Now, uh, you know, most kids have got a phone. They've got a, a laptop. They've got an iPad or whatever else they've got. They've got the best trainers. We used to train in plumsoles, 199. <laughs> and even then, they had holes in them. You know what I mean? And uh, we had to cover them up and, uh, uh, and, and have wet socks and God knows what else. We used to run in them. Now they have to run in 150-pound trainers, otherwise they hurt the ankles or they get a <laughs> blister. Do, do you know what? Do you think... you know, you, you got, like, the Rocky movies, right, back yeah, in the day, yeah. and there's always... You get the world champions that come from the ghettos. And so, you know, like, the, yeah, the, yeah. the, the deeper you're in poverty, the better you can be at boxing. It's a hungry person's sport. Do you think? Do you think that it, it impacts I, I the think success? It makes a massive long-term. difference. I think it makes a massive difference because you've got a goal, you've got something that you want. If you, it, it, like Marvin Hagler said at once, you know, once uh, the, uh, one of his quotes, you can't, you can't wait, you can't get out of, you can't train when sleeping in silk sheets. Mm. Get out in the mornings, you know, go for your runs in the cold. You know, once, once, once you've got that money, you've got a good lifestyle. You're not going to push through a hard session. Um, or get up in the morning to train, train with a sore nose or a broken rib or something. You know, some things that I've done in the past. You know, I've had to, I've had to push through with a cracked rib. I've had to push through with a broken nose, or with a broken hand. Things like that, you know. And it's because you want to make a better life, whether it's for your family, whether it's for you. And it drives you and it pushes you through um, all them tough times. If you had to give some advice, if there's any kid, we don't, I'm pretty sure we've not got many kids listening to us at the moment, right? It's a radio station. Um, what advice would you give? So now I've got three boys. Think, what I, advice would I you think, give? I think it's what I say all the time. You know, believe in yourself. Anything you want, you can achieve, but work hard. Mm. Yeah, and always get the blessings from your parents and your family. Little things like that. You know, um, don't just say I want to do this and expect it to happen. Nothing is going to be given to you easily. You know, if you want something, you have to work hard for it. Mm-hmm. And then, so we're talking about boxing, right? We've, we've talked a little bit about MMA, about people doing it just to keep fit some people taking it a bit more seriously it's become much more accessible now mm-hmm. compared to what it was before where you just get people doing it professionally doing it properly um, has that so, so, so your gym are you seeing, experiencing that in your gym where you're getting lots of uh, 
so the programs and the classes that you run, yeah, right, are they fairly diverse? Do they sort of represent that? Is it? Is, is it I think I think we get um, a good diverse um, community that come to the gym. Uh, we get young people, old people, different different backgrounds. Um, a lot of people that come from a really rough rough uh, areas um, haven't got anything that they want. You know, they see the like you said, they, they see the Rocky films. They they have them dreams of you know. Um, making it, making it in boxing, making a life from them, you know, and they hear about that. All these old champions used to say, um, I had nothing and, and boxing was my way out. And, mm. and they think they can do it, but um, a lot of people don't realize there's so much hard work to be done and, and over a period of time. It's not two, three, four, five years. You know, it could take 10, 15 years before you achieve anything and get anywhere. And that discipline as well, right? Because I mean, we've talked about discipline, goal setting, all these things. And I'm, I'm just sort of thinking about BJJ as well. All these things they benefit people in life just holistically. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you do. So even if you don't want to compete for, you know, WBC world champion heavyweight, whatever. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not going for that, it still benefits you. You talked about self-esteem earlier. You talked about yeah, for yeah. young kids. Um, it it sort of complements everything else. It gives kids that self-esteem, right? Um, in terms of sort of what uh, what do you think some of those benefits are? Yeah, I, think, I think I've, um, I've, I've touched on this in quite, quite a few times, really. I've touched on these things. A lot of the, the kids nowadays have got no role models. They've got no discipline. Um, with all the laws nowadays where the teachers can't say anything, the parents can't say anything to the kids, the kids have got the power, or they feel like they've got the power. Whereas back in the day, um, we, used to have, we used to be fearful of our parents and teachers and police and have respect as well as a bit of fear. You know, if they said something, we'd listen. Nowadays, they'll batch at you, they'll say whatever. I think boxing, memory, teaching, all these sports, they teach you a bit of discipline and respect. You know, a lot of the kids haven't got respect for elders. It's, 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 that's why society has gone really bad, I believe, you know. I think, I think we need that bit of discipline back. Um, and I think boxing gyms and these places give you that in a, as I, as I always say, in a bit of a legal way, you know. They can come to the gym and we can uh, be a little bit harder on them um, without getting into a, uh, trouble like, 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 like they can in nowadays. It's silly, you know, it's just, um, it's giving the kids all this power and, and stuff where they come to my gym and they have to listen. They don't mess about. The, mm -hmm. the, parents, the, the parents bring them partly for that reason. They say, Jav, if you, you know, can you, you can do what you like with them and you can do this with them and sort make sure they're you know, they sorted out and stuff. And most of the kids that come to our gym listen, they go home. They start becoming better yeah. in their concentration. They listen and respect their parents a little bit more. Yes, they love the little tantrums. We, you know, all kids do. Um, and I think a lot of them have said they, they're working better at school, concentrating better, and uh, and it benefits them. Like you said, in, in, the, in the whole in, the, in their lives, not just. Um, and, and you don't have to be a boxer. You don't have to become a boxer. You don't have to, to make it your profession. You know, um, it'll just help you um, all around. Mm -hmm. Now, I was actually about to ask about the parents. I was going to say, are, uh, how do the parents feel about you being a bit harsher in the gym, with that sort of thing? Do you get some so any sort of kickback from the parents saying, oh, no, you, you, sh you, know, you shouldn't be shouting at my kids? Because sometimes yeah. you get that at school yeah, with teachers, you know, where parents come in and they'll have a go at the teacher saying, look, you're being too harsh with my kids, you know, you need to let them off or whatever. Do you ever get that from the parents of some of your students? I or are I, they more, I, like, I, encouraging? I think, I think in the 20-odd years, there's been a couple or so that have been okay. a bit... That I've probably said, oh, you know, you're a little bit hard. Can you be a bit softer on the kids? Um, I think most of them love it. They mm. they can't do it themselves, so they were they're happy that somebody else is able oh, to do okay. it. You know, because I think they find it they're, they're, they're looking for the easy way out. Mm. Um, nowadays, I think too many pa parents are trying to be too friendly with their kids, and they treat them like kids. And then when you become friends, they'll say wrong things or just be dis disrespectful back to the parents in, mm. without knowing they're doing it sometimes you know yeah, not, yeah. not that they're deliberately doing it but sometimes without knowing it because you've been too friendly you have to understand um, the barrier you know you have to understand where, how far you can go and the thing is there's no shortage of gyms where you can go and they'll treat you nicely as mm. long as you pay them yeah, yeah. You, you know you'll pay a de healthy amount right you know you'll give them a decent amount and they'll treat your kid exactly yeah. as, you, as a parent wants them treated that's right so that's interesting. I mean, th that sort of tough love, because that's kind of missing nowadays. I think, I think that is missing. That's, that's, that's missing, you know. Um, I'll give that whether they ask me or don't. They, <laughs> <laughs> they, get, they get it as an extra. 
No, it's needed. Yes. Listen, I've got three boys. Oh, yeah. I've got three boys, and um, they say the exact same thing about me. They say, look, you're a little bit too harsh. I, I, and, and I do have to keep on checking myself as well. I'm a little bit too harsh. But mm. then I, remind, I have to say to them, look, I'm just trying to get you ready for life because it's tough. And whatever you do, boxing, martial arts, kickboxing, whatever it is, you're going to struggle and you're going to go through ups and downs. And I just don't want you to think life is too easy. Or it's too comfortable. So I want you. That, you need that little bit of struggle. Yeah, yeah, I, I, think, that I, think, I think that's what makes people the struggles. That's mm-hmm. what makes it because you have to go down. You have to. You have to struggle and understand how hard it is to like, appreciate when things are good and, and you achieve things. Because you never understand otherwise. I mean, if, no. if, if everything's all hunky dory at some mm-hmm. point, because as soon as you in, in boxing, I'm, yeah, I'm guessing if you win the first 10 fights and there yeah. are easy fights and then you lose and then uh, how, how common is it for people to, to then just disappear off the scene oh, yeah, yeah. Um, sort of burn out yeah, it happens all the time I think it happens all the time you know you get people that um, are on top fighters as we call it so when things are going well they love it yeah. as soon as things go bad that's it they just want to give up mm. and uh, you can't do that in anything in life you know, you're know, going to have ups and downs and that's where you've got to show your, your strength and uh, and come back from it and uh, and prove to people that you will, you can do better. And a lot of these these are tests. Um, they they are tests that you learn from and you become better. When I lost my one fight, I lost as a professional. I believe had I not lost that, I would never got my championship wins. Wow! Okay. Because that taught me more than all them 10, 15 fights I had that I won. Mm. I learned that I couldn't do certain things. Yes, it was a I can make excuses that it was a four four day notice fight in France, and it was against the French champion. And I wasn't experienced and ready for it. Yeah. Um, but I had to take it because I was older and I needed to get a move on. So I took a risky fight, um, and I lost a close one on points, which I could have won had I had believed a little bit more. And that gave me that extra belief. I started thinking, I've got to work on a couple of things, and then I became a better fighter. Had that not happened, I would have never got to the position I was in because I wouldn't have experienced that. And I want to improve. I want to work on the things I needed to yeah. really work on. You know, we always look at the things that we're doing good and forget about the things we're doing bad. And and, and that's what you got to do in life. I think look at the things you're doing bad and improve on them. Not just keep doing the things you're doing good. Otherwise, you're going to stagnate and you're not going to get any further. I was compete amateur, not professional or anything, not on your level. But mm. I was competing about what is it? it was about a month ago mm. in BJJ yeah. and. Um, I've not competed much. I, d- I don't particularly like competing. I, I, I just find it so difficult yeah. Yeah, mentally. It's, it's tough, man. Yeah, hats off to you guys. I think people do not realise what it's like to they get don't. into a ring. And I've always said, whatever level it is, whether it's the novice level, the first fight as an amateur, getting into the ring is one of the most scariest feelings you're going to get ever. There's so many pressures, so many things go through your head. And to actually go there and do whatever you do, whether it's good, bad, whatever, full respect. Do, do you know what? 100%. Hundred percent. People don't realise. No, no. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm like. I'm, I'm always telling my friends, family, people, come down, have a try. Just have a try. Not, not in the comp- not competing, but just yeah. in training. Even that gives you an understanding of how tough it is. Do you know? What? I'd even go as far to say that I, th- I think every every adult right should compete at least once. Oh, right? That would be, that would uh, be amazing. Uh, I think the world would be a better place. It would, wouldn't it? I actually think would. the world would be, would be a better place. It would humble people. It, it would humble a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd say 90% of people that are in combat sports are generally very respectful, good people. You're always going to get the idiots, a few of them that want to be like the Mike Tyson's and not people's noses through the schools and whatever, <laughs> yeah? But most of them are all very good, respectful people because they understand what they kind of do. And, and they respect the, the hard work ethic. Yeah. And I remember hearing this before. Uh, if, if, if you look at the amount of fights, like proper fights that you get in a gym mm. versus the fights you get on a Friday night or a Saturday mm-hmm. night, okay, you can't even compare the two. Um, it, it, it just, yeah, there's, there's drama and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. road rage as well. Road rage, I tell you, would drop massively. <laughs> if everybody just wants in their life, yeah, yeah, yeah. forget the competing, just trained. Just in BJJ went from white belt, just a couple of stripes on, there's four stripes that you get, and then you go up to the next belt. If you just got two stripes on that, you just do about six months, or a few months, that's enough. You would humble yourself. I think back in the day, they used to have it in schools, and I think that was a good thing. What's that? Boxing. Boxing. They should should be bringing it back into schools. Um, That would make a massive difference. I think it'd 
um, help kids release that energy, mm. rele release that aggression, and they'd be a lot calmer, a lot better, uh, and, and probably concentrate better and listen more. Do you know what? I've, I've got to ask you this, right? We don't have long left. There's a couple of minutes, but I've got to ask you this. So I remember I was speaking to a mother, and she had a son who was into boxing, and she was saying that he can't tell the other kids at school. I said, yeah, he must be really proud, and his self-esteem must be up here, and he must like show off about his boxing and be really proud about it. She said, no, 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 of course not. I said, why not? She said, no, they, they make fun out of him. I, I, I just, it just didn't make any sense. Make I, fun I, of it? Yeah, yeah I, I, I was like, but he can fight, and he does boxing. And she's like, no, no they make fun out of him because, yeah, it's... I just couldn't quite make sense of it. Yeah, I, yeah. Thought, I think, I, I I think, I think um, when I started, I think it was probably similar, uh, where I didn't want to tell anybody. I think everyone that started finding out, it's like, oh, whenever we have a fight, we're going to put Jab in front. He can be, he can, he can fight these people. And, these. and then I realized it's not, boxing is not about fighting. It's not the same as fighting. It's totally different. And, you know, you can be a very good boxer, but, and you, you know, you could handle yourself, you can look after yourself, but you're not a proper, you're not a fighter on the streets. It's a different kind of, um, a, a totally different thing, totally different thing, and uh, and you know, the kids probably take for make fun of them, and, and they, probably, they probably don't like that. And it's a form of bullying in a sense, you know. Mm. And then in terms of like ego, right? Do you think I, I'm I'm just thinking because my oldest is is about to go into secondary. I'm just thinking if they had a boxing club, I I don't know how that would end up. Either it'd just be all the bigger kids just picking on the yeah, small. Yeah. Nobody can box. None of them can box, <laughs> and you're just going to get a whole lot of bullying going on. If you can get them to like three months, I think they'd be great then. But yeah. how, how, how do you get them from like the, the yeah. first few lessons where I, you I, get I, I, I've you? been doing um, classes in schools uh, on and off for quite a few years. Oh. I, I was doing quite a yeah. few at the beginning. We were doing like it's non contact box. So you don't do any sparring in the school. Okay. And you, you, you direct them to the gym if they want to come and spar because that's where we're um, insured to okay. let them spar. And we have the correct equipment there as well. Um, in the schools, it's more about. Um, fitness and boxing techniques and maybe pads and stuff like that boxing you know between each other um, and, and it was going quite well we had uh, we always get a few that are disruptive and mess about in the classes but generally we had no problems and I even done um, youth services with you know troubled kids that mm. come in and, and, and in, all, in all that time we probably had one or two that almost became scuffles but uh, you know over the years um, no, no problems like I say they have a bit more respect and listen to the coaches a bit more I think yeah. and uh, and be a bit more um, respectful in the, in the classes as well I think yeah. great stuff Jeff we're out of time yeah, thank you very much love to speak before, before, before I go could I just announce one thing um, we've got a bike ride on the 8th of July at 10 o'clock at Rufford um, Waters uh, in Leicestershire um, we're raising money for Teenage Cancer Trust and power up our charity that is working alongside the Boxing Academy. Um, my sister passed away with cancer last year, oh, mm, and uh, really we're raising money for that. Uh, we raised some money when I done the marathon last uh, in London Marathon last month or two months ago. Uh, we're doing another little uh, event uh, where we're going to have people come in. Uh, you can hire a bike on the day or before the day, but you do have to register on a link on our Facebook or Instagram page, Jared Khalik, um, or Jared underscore Khalik on Instagram and Jared Khalik on Facebook. Uh, if there, um, if there anybody listening, please um, get involved, donate, and um, register. Come down uh, and uh, join in with the bike ride. Um, for all those that never got to do the 12 hours with me, come and try 26 on the on the bike ride. Uh, maybe you'll uh, you'll get to the end, not like in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive, um, great cause, great bit of exercise as well. So works. Thank you for having me well. and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, take care, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, man. Thanks, everyone. Uh, that's uh, Hamza and Shafiq signing off from the Verbal Outpost for this week. We're back again next week, inshallah, or oh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, take care in the meanwhile. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.